Good morning, Jerusalem. Is it well with your souls? Before I begin this morning, I want to congratulate Ms. Jalen Brown on being elected as the SGA Vice President at Alabama State University. Jalen, we want you to know that we are very proud of you and we are praying for your success. And to all our students, please let us know about your school activities and your academic achievements so we can share the joy with you. Again, congratulations, Jalen Brown. Now for the last three Sundays, we've looked at the first two verses in chapter one of the book of Colossians. And to be honest, we really have not even scratched the surface of what all is entailed in those two verses. I hope, however, that we have been able to shed some light on the salutation and show that it was more than just a nice way of Paul way of greeting the believers at Colossae, but that there are many other important and strong admonitions in it. And so the last two Sundays we talked about grace be unto you and also peace be unto you. Now, I don't know how far the Holy Spirit will have me to navigate through this particular book. So until I move to go in a different direction, let me just continue to ask you to turn me to the Colossians again. This time we go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. That's Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And there we'll find these words written. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Let us pray. Lord, we do bless you for another day. We do praise you for your kindness and your tender mercies to your children. And we thank you most of all for salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We come now asking again that you would give us the illumination of your word. And then God give us ears to hear, hearts to believe, and wills to carry out your divine will accordingly. Bless your word as it goes forth. And we will praise you forever. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. This morning, I want to talk about something to thank God for. Something to thank God for. Now, after the salutation that opens this letter to the Colossians, Paul immediately shares with them the fact that he is very thankful for some things that he has heard about them. Now, this in itself says a great deal because too often we are saddened about what we hear about others, particularly about the church in this day and time. And although there is a lot of good news that should be talked about concerning the church, there's also a lot of news that is not so good that seems to get the most attention today. There are stories of misconduct and malfeasance in many places. There are stories of the failure to rightly divide the word of God, which has reduced some pulpits to mere stages of personal showmanship. Choirs have resorted to entertaining the people rather than singing praises unto God. And many would rather emphasize building buildings and increasing budgets rather than building up people and increasing faith. Yes, there are some things that should not be the focus of the church's work. And we must be sure that we emphasize mission and ministry that seeks to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ as a top priority. However, no matter what is going on, we must remember that Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Therefore, we must always look to see what God is doing, even in the midst of our mess. Now, it is with good reason that we can believe that the Apostle Paul never visited Colossae, and that even now he is writing just to correct some situations that would possibly lead them astray. 
But first and foremost, before he straightens them out on some things, he finds some things to be thankful for. You know, I am also thankful to God today for the fact that the same thing that Paul was thankful to God for, we too can be thankful for, not only here at Jerusalem, but also in other local congregations. So what were those things that Paul was thankful for? Well, here's my first point. The first thing he was thankful to God for was their faith in Christ. That's right. He was thankful to God for their faith in Christ. Now, as it states, understand, Paul is not thanking them for their faith, but he's thanking God for their faith. See, he recognized something that we must all recognize, and that is the fact that if someone is saved, it is by faith in Christ, and that faith did not originate with them, but it's a gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is though Paul is saying, I am thankful to God for each time I hear about the fact that God is still saving people. And the nature of that salvation is through faith in Christ through the gospel. He is saying that the fact that what God has done is nothing short of amazing when you consider it in its totality and its scope. See, God is holy and man is sinful. And the wrath of God is revealed through the history of the world and the same wrath of God is revealed by the judgment upon sinful men. Every man will face God's wrath either in time or in the judgment. And what he needs is something that will enable him to see God's face in peace. Now, his own self-righteousness won't do. For the Bible says that by the deeds of the law, no man will be justified. But God has provided a means of righteousness for sinful man, and it comes through faith. That faith is a gift from God. Listen, we should thank God whenever we hear of his work of bringing men to salvation because that is good news. Now, God is still bringing men, women, boys, and girls to faith in Christ. The question is, are you a part of that great endeavor? Well, the next thing that Paul was thankful for, and here's my second point, and that was he thanks God for their love for all the saints. That's right. He thanks God for their love for all the saints. The genuineness of their faith in Christ was attested to by the fact that it manifested itself in love for all the saints. Now, we are not told on what basis Paul makes this assertion, but we can be assured that the love they had for one another was not some mystical love, but it was practical and actual. It was not something that was just supposed to be, but it was something that could be seen, pointed to, and talked about. It was a tangible love, and Paul had heard about it. This is very significant uh, as a very significant statement because whatever it was that they were doing, it was obvious and it was apparent that they had love for all of the saints. So what do you suppose they were doing to show their love? Well, really in particular, we don't know. But apparently what was motivated by the fact uh, of their love was them knowing that faith worked through love. So even as we wonder what they were doing, we do well to ask ourselves, how can we show love to all the saints. You know, many people say, I love you. But see, it needs to be demonstrated. What can you do to show that? How can you make your love for the saints more tangible? Well, a few things we need to consider is to first of all, be genuinely concerned with the salvation of all people. See, as a body in Christ, we have united in covenant that says that we ought to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances. That means that 
while we should do mission and evangelistic work to foreign nations and abroad, we cannot fail to look in our own backyard and in our own homes and not share the gospel with our own kinfolks. And listen, I know it might be a tough sale sometimes because they know you almost better than you know yourself. And although you are saved, they won't easily forget how you used to live or what you used to do, especially if you used to do it with them. But listen, you can't worry about that because if you know that God has transformed your life and you are now living and walking according to his word, you just keep doing that and share the love of Jesus Christ with them. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring about conviction to them. You just be sure that you give the Holy Spirit something to work with by your example and you're sharing the gospel with them. Well, another thing that we can do to show our love to all the saints is through our continuous prayers for one another. See, prayer is always in order and it should be done without ceasing. But after we have prayed for people, we must be willing to follow up with acts of kindness with them. With all that is going on in the world today, there's much that we can do to show people how much we love them. The recent disasters that have been experienced by many in South Mississippi and Louisiana has presented a great opportunity for us to share the love of Jesus Christ with those who have been affected. And I want to just take time to say thank you, Jerusalem for what you have already done and are continually doing in those efforts. And if anyone who's fellowshipping with us this morning wants to do more, just let me know and we'll make sure that it gets done. But see, a disaster shouldn't be the only time that there's an outpouring of love being shown. We should do it every day, like watching out for our seniors and the elderly mentoring and helping to guide our children through these chaotic and confusing times. And since we have not been able to have in-person fellowship, just take time one day to call someone that you haven't seen in a while. You know, that would no doubt brighten up their day. Yes, my brothers and sisters, love can be expressed in many ways. And Paul had heard about that love that the church in Colossae had shown toward all the saints. And that is exactly what should be said about us. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 13 and verse 35, By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. That's how people will know that we belong to him. Love for one another. Not our church affiliation, but our love. Not the religious titles that we claim, but our love. Not how big our building is or how many ministries we can boast about, but our love one to another. There's a song we used to sing that says, we are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. Well, after Paul thanked God for their faith in Christ, and then after he thanked God for their love for all the saints, he then thanks God, and here's my last point, for the hope that is laid up for them in heaven. That's right. He thanks God for the hope that is laid up for them in heaven. Now, when we consider these three things for which Paul was thankful to God for, we can't help but see that these are the three abiding Christian virtues that he also mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Faith, hope, and love. See, faith rests upon the past. Love works in the present. But hope looks to and presses on toward the future. Now, to appreciate how important hope is, 
We need to remember Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15 and 8 that says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Paul says here that if all there is to Christianity is in this present life only, man, we are some miserable people. He says, if you are just resigned to just this life only, then you really don't understand the Christian hope. If you think, as many people so erroneously do, that this life is it and there's nothing else, then you are sadly mistaken. Because the consistent teaching of the word of God is that the full and complete blessings of the Christian hope is not on this side, but on the other side. See, God's purpose in salvation is to make us like his son, Jesus Christ. And in becoming like Jesus, we will not only be like him, but we will see him as he is in his full glory and his splendor. And then the Holy Spirit comes along and he is our earnest, our, our down payment, or our guarantee for the inheritance that God has awaiting on all of his children. So hope keeps me on track. Hope keeps me steadfast in the faith. Hope keeps me pressing toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says in Romans 5, 1 through 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And watch this, he says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, Knowing that tribulation works with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Listen, John also joins in and John declares in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. Oh, glory to God. That's some good news there. And then he says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Listen, I don't know about you, but my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness and I dare not trust the sweetest frame but I wholly lean on Jesus name because on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is singing saying and that's why I can say praise God I can praise him from, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same the Lord is worthy to be praised yes Jerusalem just like Paul I thank God for your faith in Jesus Christ. I thank God for your love for all the saints. And I thank God for the hope of the inheritance that's laid up in heaven for us all. And you know, it is a sure inheritance because it's already been paid for in full. That's right. Over 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, Jesus purchased our redemption on an old rugged cross. He suffered, bled, and died for sinners like you and me. He paid a debt that we could not pay, nor could we repay. And he did it with his own precious blood. And at Calvary, he died. Oh yeah, he, he died, I tell you. But the story didn't stop there. They buried him in a borrowed tomb where he stayed there for three days and nights, but all that Sunday morning, he arose from the dead with all power and authority in his hands. And that, my brothers and sisters, is something they ought to be thankful to God for and praise him for every day of our lives. So, if you think you don't have anything to be 
thankful for, then just thank God for the faith in Jesus Christ. Thank God for the fact that we can show love to all the saints. And thank God for the hope that is laid for us up in glory when he comes back again. Let's pray. God, our Father, we not only thank you, but we praise you for who you are and what you have done. You have given us hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. You have given us the ability to love all the saints because of your love for us. And you have given us faith as a gift that we can exercise it to believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you so much for all you have done on our behalf. We ask, oh God, that you will now touch someone who may not have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior and help us as the church, the body of Christ, to always tell somebody about the good news of Jesus. Lord, we love you today and we praise you and we give you the glory and the honor that belongs to you and you alone. We ask this all now in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as we go away, again, let us remember what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. And don't forget, as you go, forgive somebody because someone needs forgiveness now. And as the opportunity presents itself, share the love of Jesus Christ with those you come in contact with. And remember, at Jerusalem, we are ministering with eternity in view.